Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good morning. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Special study this morning called The Word Was Made Flesh. Speaking about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who was born in the flesh, and He paid that incredible price on the cross for us. And it's such an obvious statement to say how Jesus Christ was born in the flesh, but it's something that often might be kind of overlooked on how truly important it is to understand that. And that's what we're going to get into in this study today. You know from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel being interpreted as God with us. So Jesus Christ would be born of a virgin. But really, when he truly began dwelling in the flesh was when he began to be in Mary's womb. As you see in Luke chapter 1, about verse 41, when Mary came into her cousin Elizabeth and uh, gave her a salutation, then John the Baptist, who was already in Elizabeth's womb, he leaped for joy while he was in the womb. He felt the presence of Jesus Christ. And then Elizabeth, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit at that time. And you see in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, God was manifest in the flesh, seen of angels, justified in the Spirit, preached unto the Gentiles, and received unto glory. He did pay that price on the cross, but then three days later, He resurrected. Then He walked with them for 40 days, and then He returned to the Father. And you see, God always knew that we were going to need a Savior. We're going to begin our study in John chapter 1. And you see, Jesus Christ has always been. And so let's learn about how the Word was made flesh. Let's get into it. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word. We thank you for this place you've given us. We can teach your Word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your Word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen. So, all right, the Gospel of John, that we see all throughout this Gospel of John how Jesus Christ is presented as God himself. John chapter 10, verse 30, Christ says, I and my Father are one. And John chapter 14 is such a beautiful chapter where Christ would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but by me. And then a little later in that chapter, he would say, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So let's learn about our Savior Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the very beginning, even before the first earth age. God has always been. Verse 2, The same was in the beginning with God. And what is the Word? It's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 3, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. God created the entire universe, every galaxy. He created it all. And you can see in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, it says, God made the world by the Son, by Jesus Christ. You see something very similar to that in Colossians chapter 1, about verses 14 through 16. Verse 4, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 5, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. When you have the true light, Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter if some darkness might try to come upon you. The light shines over it. The darkness has no power over it at all. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. 
Now this John here of this verse 6 is speaking of John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus Christ, the one who was uh, already six months in Elizabeth's womb when Jesus Christ began dwelling in the flesh in Mary's womb. And John the Baptist is not the same John as the author of this Gospel of John. Verse 7, The same came for a witness, to bear the witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. Jesus Christ gives the opportunity for salvation to whomsoever will. And as it was even prophesied back in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, how John the Baptist would be the forerunner. He would be that voice crying from the wilderness, paving the way for the Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 8, He was not that light. John the Baptist is not that light. Jesus Christ is. But was sent to bear witness of that light. Do you bear witness of that light? Verse 9. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That's Jesus Christ. It says in John chapter 18, verse 12, Jesus Christ says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Peace of mind happiness, comfort, those things that only come through the Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. Many hated Him. So if they hated Him, you think people aren't going to hate you? Yeah, some people will hate you. Who cares? Your reward's great in heaven. You know Luke chapter 6, verse 22 through 26. Verse, uh, verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You have to believe. Verse 13. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To be born of the Spirit, meaning that you believe in Jesus Christ. That's the only way to salvation. No man can believe for you. That only comes from within, that you have that true belief in Jesus Christ, and you do receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now we saw back in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now we have it here, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So I hope you do not have any doubt about who Jesus Christ is. Verse 15, John, that's John the Baptist, bear witness of him, and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me, you remember John the Baptist was six months older, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. All the way at the very beginning, even before the first earth age, before even any of our souls were even created. 16. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. You continually receive God's grace. We all sin, we all fall short, but when you believe in Jesus Christ, you just repent, and your sins are washed away as if they never existed. The incredible grace that none of us deserve it, because we all fall short, we all sin. But Christ paid the price on the cross, and that grace abounds to those who believe in Him. Verse 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And the, the law taught us what is right and what was wrong, but what the law mainly does is just convicts us as sinners. And we are. But Jesus Christ brought the grace 
He brought the truth. He brought repentance. He brought forgiveness of sins. The law cannot save you, but Jesus Christ does. Praise God. Verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Nobody while they were in the flesh has seen the face of the Father. Now, God came in the flesh as the Son, Jesus Christ. God came in the flesh as Melchizedek. You might remember Genesis chapter 32 when Jacob, he wrestled with God. And Jacob said, I've seen God face to face. Even called the place Penuel, the face of God. But you see, those were times that God came in the flesh in the way that He could be seen. But no man that's in the flesh has actually seen the face of the Father. Now, we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2. Let's uh, build on this a little bit. Um, never forget in Philippians chapter 1, uh, what's going on? And Paul's in prison. Why? For doing a bunch of evil stuff? No, just for teaching the truth of Jesus Christ. But never forget what he says in chapter 1, verse 14. He says, hey, all these things have happened to me for the furtherance of the gospel. The things they need to happen so the gospel could be brought forth. And like it would say in one scripture, even though I might be bound, the word of God is not bound. So you remember that there might be some situations you might think, well, why is this happening? Well, maybe it's for the furtherance of the gospel. Now, don't go saying, oh, every little thing that happens is don't go blame it on God, obviously. But there are some times, remember, if you ever want to start blaming God for your problems, read Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 33 through 40. See how big of a mistake that is. But there are certain things that happen that might not seem too good at the time, but sometimes they need to happen for the furtherance of the gospel. So you just stand strong just like Paul did, and you keep serving Jesus Christ, keep bringing forth the gospel, teaching others about the Savior. So we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2. Got Philippians uh, right after Ephesians and right before Colossians. So we're going to go uh, Philippians chapter 2, picking it up in verse 1. And it reads, If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, and there's a whole lot of all that when you serve Jesus Christ. Verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. You know how you can do that? Stick to the Word of God. Don't get wrapped up in false doctrines and traditions of men that make the Word of God of none effect, like you see in Mark chapter 7, verse 13. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Meaning just trying to build yourself up, trying to exalt yourself. That's not the way of a Christian. But in lowliness of mind, let each other esteem other better than themselves. You remain humble and you even put others above yourself. You remember when Christ would be asked, what's the great commandment? He said, love God with all your heart and all your soul, and all your mind. And then the next one after that, love others as yourself. You, our main job is to bring others to the truth, bring others to Jesus Christ. If that means you got to be low, so be it. Jesus Christ came as a servant. That's what He was in the flesh, even though He is God. But he came in the flesh as a servant to all. So with that being the case, and you would exalt yourself? I sure hope not. Verse 4. And I wanted to mention, so there's a lot of times people, they get all wrapped up. They really want to do everything they can to like try to exalt their self in a church system. Who cares about that? You just serve God. You study His Word, and don't worry. God's going to put you exactly where He wants you. 
But if you spend all your time trying to just like please men, trying to rise up in a church system, that means you're serving men and yourself, not serving God. Never make that mistake. Verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Verse 5. I mean, what's more important, you rising up in some system or you bringing others to Jesus Christ? Easiest answer you could ever ask for. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He is equal with God. He is God. Verse 7. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, to die on the cross for us, for our sins. He had no sin. Verse 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, that's, uh, take it back even to the Hebrew, Yeshua, the Savior that Yahweh sent, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth. Every knee will bow when Jesus Christ returned to the second advent. Verse 11, And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, not like, oh yeah, let's just try to serve God while Paul's watching, you know, obviously, don't be like that. But now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What a fantastic verse. This is teaching us your mindset shouldn't be, oh, I'm saved, don't ever need to do anything. You know, No, that's not the way of a Christian. Christ even came as a servant, so we are servants. We're to serve God. And you better have fear and trembling, meaning you know if you want to go the way of evil, yeah, you better fear. You better tremble, but if you just serve Jesus Christ, you do your best, you study God's Word, you have rewards coming that no one's ever even imagined. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. God works in you so you can serve Him. You can do His work, not just to do nothing. Of course, it's only God that saves through Jesus Christ. You don't save yourself, but you've got to do something for Him. Why wouldn't you, after He paid the price on the cross, how could you not want to serve Him? 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Don't be complaining. 15. I mean, the, the Israelites, over and over, when God brought them out of Egypt, they just kept complaining and murmuring over and over and over what ended up happening. God ended up killing them all, except for um, all of them that were over 20 years old at the time of the numbering, except for Caleb and Joshua. Then the younger generation ended up going into the promised land. But do not murmur against God. How could you after all He's done for us? 15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. You, in a wicked world as it is today, you shine the true light, which is Jesus Christ. You don't be overcome with evil, but you, be, you overcome evil with good. That's the last verse of Romans chapter 12, 16. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. 
what a sad state it would have, affairs it would be that Paul dedicated his entire life to bringing people to the truth, and then what if the people he taught just didn't even care? That would be a very sad thing. And there might be times that it seems like no one listens to you. Don't worry. You, many times you will not ever see the fruit of the seeds that you planted. Maybe we'll never ever know. But you just keep studying, keep planting seeds of truth, and you never know when God's just going to make it click in their mind. It could be years later, years later that you never even saw Him again. But you keep doing God's work. Our job is a servant to Almighty God. Even Christ became a servant in the flesh. Now turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. Going backwards, going to you'd have Galatians, uh, then Corinthians, then Romans, going backwards. So we're going to go Romans chapter 8, verse 1. We have a great deal about God's elect later in this chapter. We're not going to read those verses, but in about verses uh, 29 through 33 or so, you see how God's elect, they were predestinated, and they were justified, and they were glorified. And as you see in Ephesians chapter 1, the elect were chosen before the foundation of this world. Well, what's that mean? They were chosen in the first earth age when Satan's original rebellion took place. And it says in Romans chapter 8, it says, Who shall lay anything charged against God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And God's elect, you have a destiny to stand against the false Christ and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you when Satan does arrive as the false Messiah. We'll be getting into that a little bit here soon in this study. So let's pick it up, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, and it reads, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the flesh, or, or who walk not after the flesh, excuse me, but after the Spirit. There we have it again. Does it just say, oh, you believe, so nothing else matters? No, of course not. Do not walk in the flesh. You walk in the Spirit. You do not focus on the things of this world, the pride and the lust of the flesh. Verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. I mean, the law, it's just constantly holding things against you, convicting you. And is the law all the way done away with? Of course not. The ceremonies and the rituals and the blood sacrifices were nailed to the cross. Those things were done away with. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, and the following verses. But the morals of the law remain the same. They teach us what's right and what is wrong. But you see, now we are under grace. To where you have that grace, you have that forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. And what is fantastic, when you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you want to do what's right. You want to follow the morals of the law. And Jesus Christ will set you free of the shackles of the lusts of the flesh. Verse 3, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh... God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Even though He was in the flesh, He did it perfect. He never sinned. You see, the law, it can't save you. Only Jesus Christ does. Verse 4, That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The law is righteous. And you do want to follow those morals of the law. It's your, it's your natural instinct to do what's right when you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Ask yourself, what do you focus on? What do you care about? You know, there are many that are really Scripture lawyers, and they might know a lot about God's Word, but so many of them, all they want to do nonstop is judge other people, tell other people they're wrong about stuff, just go around, just and they, they don't have the love of Christ in them. 
Yeah, they might know the law, but they don't truly know Christ. And they're just focused on the flesh, exalting themselves, making other people think, well, they want others to think they are so wise. And they oftentimes, they want to judge other people, people who newly came to Jesus Christ, want to say, oh, they're not doing things right. Well, they just came to Christ. You expect them to be perfect? Of course not. A bunch of holier-than-thou hypocrites. And they don't know Christ. Verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That true peace that only comes through Jesus Christ. Now, skip down with me to verse 16 of this same chapter. There's some fantastic things in the verses in the middle there. You can study those on your own. But for the sake of time, let's skip down to verse 16, Romans chapter 8, and it reads, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. How incredible is that? If so, be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. And you know, as it's written in another place, I believe it's, actually, I think it's 2 Timothy chapter 2, about verse 12, if I'm not mistaken, it says, all, actually, I might be wrong about that, but anyway, there's a verse that says, all who live godly, shall suffer persecution. Verse 18. For I read, did I finish that last? If so, be that we suffer with him, we may be also glorified together. Okay, I think I got that. Okay, verse 18. Now listen to this verse. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That is so amazing. You're going through a real hard time. Don't worry. It's going to be fine. The suffering state, it's not even compared to the glory. That is, if you remain loyal to Jesus Christ, if you're willing to make a stand for Him, if you follow the Spirit and don't let the flesh control you. Now let's turn to uh, the first epistle of John. Uh, we got toward the end of the Bible here. Uh, just before Revelation and Jude, you have these little epistles of John. Same author as the Gospel of John, same author as the book of Revelation. But of course, even though John wrote it down as the whole Word of God, it's actually God who is the author. And through John, God sure taught us a whole lot about the Antichrist in the book of Revelation. What's the book of Revelation? What's Revelation the word mean? It means to reveal, to take the cover off. And that's what the book of Revelation does. It reveals to you exactly how the end goes down. Now we're going to pick it up in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. You'd see in a couple verses leading up to this earlier in 1 John chapter 2, it says how um, you have overcome the wicked one. Well, who is the Antichrist? It is the wicked one. It's Satan himself. Just like you see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. What's that word transformed mean? Look it up in your strongest concordance. It means disguised. He will. And what does antichrist mean? Check it out in your strongest concordance. Do a little study. See the other places that Greek word is used. It means instead of. Satan is going to arrive on earth. He's going to claim to be the true Messiah. And you can read about when he'll be cast out in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, in the following verses. But we're going to get some information here that I think is very important, that is true wisdom straight from Almighty God. And it kind of, and what we're going to kind of start here, it really picks right up right where we left off in Romans chapter 8. And remember, Romans chapter 8 taught about God's elect later in the chapter. Those are the ones that are going to stand against the Antichrist. So let's go. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, and it reads, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, 
The love of the Father is not in him. Now, of course, this is not saying, oh, don't enjoy life. No, it, it, you always enjoy life when you're serving Jesus Christ. It's saying, do not love the wicked ways of the world. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. It's something you don't want to have anything to do with. Pride was Satan's downfall in the first earth age, Ezekiel 28, verse 12 through 19. Then Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 1 through 10, gives you the prophecy of when Satan arrives as the false Christ, Antichrist. 17. And the world passeth away. All the things of this world, they're going to pass away, and then that's what you would focus on? For a mere, what, 80 years that you're going to be alive, you're going to just, you want that instead of an eternity of riches and glory with Almighty God? How can people be that short-sighted? And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. There it is again. Did it say, hey, just believe and do nothing ever again? No, God's word doesn't say that. 18. Little children, and uh, what we're about to read here, it's, I wanted to say this, it's really setting us up for what we're about to read in chapter 4 of the first epistle of John. So you hold on tight to what we're about to read in these next couple of verses. Verse 18, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that in a Christ shall come, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Mark 13, many other scriptures, even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So there, there are many antichrists, but there will ultimately be the antichrist, which is Satan himself. Verse 19, they went out from us. This is a verse that everyone needs to really think about, this verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. There are going to be people that you've studied God's Word with, that you studied under the same ministry as, that you thought that you were really on the same page with. But then some of them, all of a sudden, they're just going to go astray. They're going to go, fall away into false doctrine, going to get wrapped up in a whole bunch of garbage, and it makes you marvel and say, what's wrong with that person? Well, you see, they went out from us, but they were not of us. Like I said, many people who they've been taught the truth, been taught by the same that you have, and you think, I mean, just take heed to this scripture. Because it's going to happen. It's already happening. You see it all the time. And it's, it's mind-boggling. But you see, it's really not mind-boggling because God said it would happen. Verse 20. But you have an unction from the Holy One. And you know all things. You have spiritual discernment. And you know that it is Almighty God that taught you the Word. That's why many times, even if you did study with the same as other people, you better realize it's not some man that taught you. It's Almighty God that taught you. And praise God for the teachers that God sends. Truly, praise God. But you better know it's God is the one that teaches you through His Holy Spirit. Verse 21, I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Saying, look, you've been taught the truth. Some people might not really get this if they had never really studied yet, but even if you just started studying, don't worry. Keep going. Even, even if this is the first time you've ever even really heard the Bible be taught, don't be discouraged if there's some things you might not necessarily understand or might not realize what's being talked about stay the course keep studying God's word and as long as you stick to this word not taking my word or anyone else's word for what they say then you will be in good shape to receive wisdom from almighty God 
all that matters is God's Word. And if you can't prove something in the Bible, don't believe it, no matter if I say it or anybody else says it. God's Word is all that matters. Verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Do you remember John chapter 8, verse 44? Christ said to him, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and when he speaketh of a lie, he speaketh of his own, because he is a liar and the father of it. Satan is the Antichrist. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So you remember that. The Antichrist denies the Father and the Son. Hold on to this for when we get to chapter 4, 23. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So that goes for anybody. A lot of people might say, oh, I believe there's a higher power, but I don't know about Christ, though. Oh, I believe in God. I don't know about Jesus Christ, though. Guess what? Then you're not saved. You're just as spiritually dead as anyone. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. God came in the flesh as Jesus Christ suffered incredibly, paid that price on the cross and resurrected. And if you deny Him, He will deny you. There is no salvation unless you truly believe in the Son, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now turn over with me a page or two to 1 John chapter 4. Holding all that in mind, you know what the Antichrist does. And, and he denies the Father and the Son. Well, what else does he do? 1 John chapter 4 verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. You test them out, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. See how important that is? If they do not confess that Christ came in the flesh, they're a false prophet, period. Verse 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already... It is in the world. The spirit of Antichrist roams the earth today. And just like you see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that chapter that tells you that before we're gathered together to Jesus Christ, there will be that deception of Satan as the false Christ. But then like it says in verse 7, it says, the mystery of iniquity already works. So that's how it is today. Yeah, there's people that deny that Christ came in the flesh. The mystery of iniquity already works. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That word let means to hold down. Satan's power, he does not have his full power at this time. Yeah, his spirit can roam the earth, but his actual body is still in heaven. But when Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9 comes to pass, Michael the archangel is going to cast out Satan onto this earth. And Satan's power will not be held down anymore. He will then have the most power that God will ever allow him to have. And he will be here on earth in person. That beautiful supernatural angel. Like he's called in Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 12. He's full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So the time will come that he will be cast out onto earth as the false Christ. You be ready for it. Now do not overlook what this said. It says that the spirit of Antichrist does not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Do you realize how important that is? So you see, when Satan arrives on the earth as the Antichrist, he is going to say he is the Messiah. He's going to say that he's God. He's going to say that he's the Savior. But there are certain things that he will not say because he's that prideful. 
and understand he's going to do it in a way that every religion is going to believe that he is God. Do not be deceived. Now turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to even see in this chapter how Christ destroys he that has the power of death, that is the devil. We're going to pick it up in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. And you see in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4, how, or Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4, Jesus Christ is so much greater than the angels. I mean, he's so much greater than all. Why? Because He's God. He's so much greater than all but the Father. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you see, what we're about to read now is that Christ was even made lower than the angels. Well, what's that mean? Someone might say, oh, God's Word contradicts itself right there. No, God's Word never contradicts itself. It means that during the time that Christ was in the flesh, in that sense, He was even lower than the angels at that moment because He was simply in the flesh. But in reality, of course, he was not lower than the angels because he is Emmanuel, God with us. Let's learn about how he did come in the flesh as the servant. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels when he was in the flesh for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, gave opportunity to whomsoever will. Verse 10. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. God's perfect righteousness he, it was God, he, what he decided was the absolute perfect righteous way is that he come in the flesh as the Son, Jesus Christ, and suffer an unbearable death. Do you understand that that shows how much he truly loves us and that his righteousness is absolutely perfect? Don't ever take that for granted. Verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. This is quoting Psalm chapter 22, verse 22. That beautiful chapter that gives, gave us detail by detail prophecy of the crucifixion hundreds of years before it ever even happened. It says, they pierced my hands and my feet. 13. And many other things, not just that, certainly in that chapter. Verse 13. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. This is even quoting Psalm chapter 18, verse 2, and Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. How many times did Paul quote the Old Testament? What an absolute tragedy that some people are taught not even to study the Old Testament. Insane. We're studying the book of Isaiah right now. How many prophecies have you already seen in the first, what, 16 chapters? Imagine just never studying that. Verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood... He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. 15. I mean, when Jesus Christ returns at that second advent, Satan's getting locked in the pit for that thousand years. Then at the end of the thousand years, Satan will have a little opportunity to deceive people one more time. Then him and whoever he convinces at that end, they go into the lake of fire. They die the second death and their soul perishes. You read about his death sentence in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. That's the second death, the death of the soul. 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. How sad is that? Many go throughout this world. They fear death. They're in shackles. They've never been taught God's word like Ecclesiastes chapter 12 where you know when your flesh body dies, your flesh returns to the dirt and your spirit returns to God who gave it. 
And if you remain loyal to Jesus Christ all the way to the end, you are so glorified, and so blessed, so rewarded. You don't have to fear death. That's when rewards come. Jesus Christ sets you free. He doesn't put you in shackles. 16. For verily, that means truly, He took not on Him the nature of angels, but He took on Him the seed of Abraham. He did not come in a body that did not feel pain. No, He came born of the seed of Abraham. And like it was prophesied in the book of Genesis, it says that through the offspring of Abraham, through his seed, would all nations be blessed. Because anyone that believes in the Savior Jesus Christ believes in, or will receive eternal life. Anyone that believes in Jesus Christ, no matter what people they are, Christ came and paid that price on the cross for whomsoever will. And he felt every bit of pain, that excruciating pain that he, played, that he felt on the cross. He did that for you. 17. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He reconciles you. You just sincerely repent and your sins are washed away like they never even existed. 18. For in that he, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. It means he's able to aid them, able to relieve them. He went through it in the flesh. So he knows exactly how to get you through it. Let's, uh, we're to complete this study, turn with me over just to Hebrews chapter 4. Three more verses. Let's build on that a little bit. Now, he came in the flesh. He was tempted in the flesh. That is, just, that is to say, people tried to tempt him. And he suffered, but he was never actually tempted. He was without sin completely. Let's document that to complete this study. Three more verses. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. And it reads, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. That means you're acknowledging. Keep teaching about Jesus Christ. Keep acknowledging He's the Son of God, that He's the Savior, that He's the only way to eternal life. Never back down from it. Never be ashamed of that. Never be embarrassed to proclaim that. How could you be? 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. That means we don't have the high priest that doesn't feel sympathy for us. Why? He came in the flesh himself. So he knows what it's like being in the flesh. He knows what it's like being hated. He knows what it's like being hungry. But he did it perfect. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 16 to complete. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Like we saw in an earlier scripture, the grace just keeps abounding. And as hard times you would see in 2 Corinthians, uh, Corinthians chapter 1, as sufferings abound, the comfort abounds, the consolation abounds. And you can go boldly to the throne of grace if you are truly doing your best to serve God. Sincerely studying His Word, truly trying to follow God's ways, you can come boldly, meaning not in like bold against God type of thing, but you just know that you're in good standing with Him. There's going to be times we all fall short, but when you do this, repent. Those sins are washed away in the blood of Christ. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Though they be red as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Isaiah 43, 25. God says, I don't even remember them. They're erased if you sincerely repent. Praise God. Why is that possible? Because Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Antichrist denies that. You know it's a fact. So... Like we mentioned at the beginning, something that's such an obvious thing. Yeah, Christ came in the flesh, but don't overlook how important that is. And the wicked ones deny that. Jesus Christ came in the flesh and He paid that price on the cross. Three days later, He resurrected. 
to bring salvation to whomsoever will. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, turn to Him. Repent of your sins. Have, have a clean slate. Have your sins washed away and have perfect happiness, perfect peace, reconciliation, eternal life abiding in you. And then your life will be beyond what it, you can even imagine. You, as long as you stay the course, you keep doing what's right, God will truly bless you beyond what you ever even thought was possible. And you have eternal life, which is blessings for all eternity. Praise God. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this incredible um, study of your word, Father. We know it's, it's your word that's incredible. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and resurrect for us. We just thank you so much for all your blessings and for giving us this place we can come and share your word. We just ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share them with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. This was recorded in the year 2024 at Smyrna Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana, by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.